Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Rivington Place. I don't know if my microphone is uh, working, but you can hear me, I'm sure. Um, welcome to tonight's Militant Image screening and discussion. Um, Militant Image is an ongoing collaboration with the Otolith Collective and Ros Gray, and it's um, film screenings and conversations, often with the directors of those films. And tonight we are lucky enough to have Penny Stemple, um, whose film we're going to be showing, which is In the National Interest, made with Chris Rushton. Um, and it's part of the, it's connected to the exhibition Keywords. And in fact, Otolith Collective have um, programmed three films that were screened on Channel 4 in the early 1980s. Um, which are normally playing in this space as part of that exhibition. And tonight we have a Penny's film. Um, we're going to begin with a short introduction um, by the Otolith Collective, talking about their selection of films for the exhibition, and an introduction to Penny, and then Penny will talk a little bit about the film, and then we'll screen the film, which will take approximately 55 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation between the three, and then a possibility for questions. So... Welcome. So, um, my God, it's really loud. Um, my name is Angelika Saga, and this is Kojo Eshin on the far left. And we are the Otolith group, but we also have this uh, name that we have uh, kind of just started to establish called the Otolith Collective, which is kind of like the, a na a sort of a name that's attached to what we do, which is kind of to announce our sort of public programs and our curatorial programs um, that we do, such as this. Um, so welcome to this special screening of In the National Interest. We're really happy to be screening this film tonight, and we're very grateful to Penny for coming all the way from Cardiff to be here with us. So I'm just going to contextualize uh, you know, a little bit about the, the platform, uh, the militant image under which this is uh, presented. So the Millicent Image series was conceived by the Oslith Collective and by Ros Gray, um, who's at Goldsmiths, that we um, have presented here at Innova and at Paris, in Paris also at the Musée du Quai Branly, um, a couple of years ago. Um, in 2011, we co-edited a volume for third text on the Millicent Image with Ros Gray. And since then, um, ourselves and Ros have uh, presented um, here, under the Militant Image, two films by Manuel Faria de Almeida, Seven Days in Lorenzo Marquez from 1965, Street, and his other film, Streets of Early Sorrow, made in 1963. We've presented Margaret Dickinson, who is also here. We've presented her film, Behind the Lines, from 1971, Robert Kramer's Scenes from, a, from the Class Struggle, from 1977, René Vautier's films, Afrique 50, um, Frontline and Les Glass, Jose Felipe Costa's Red Line from 2011 on the making of Tomas Harlan's Torre Bella from 1975. And uh, so for the, uh, the Keywords exhibition, which is downstairs, uh, we programmed three films, which are usually here. Uh, Sue Clayton and Jonathan Curling's The Song of the Shirt, Mark Harlan's Voyages, and Michael Eaton's In Darkest England. And so uh, in, in 2014, um, this exhibition, Keywords, is going to travel to Tate Liverpool. And we're planning to host a workshop at Tate Liverpool devoted to discussion around those three films. So for those of you who are interested, um, we're looking forward to, <coughs> to planning that. But this evening, uh, as we said, is devoted to a screen, a discussion around uh, in the national interest and the work of Penny Stemple. So, um, maybe a bit of context about why we've chosen this film and why we, we've uh, invited Penny to, to discuss this film with us at this moment in time. Um, so we heard about In the National Interest due to our research around militant cinema and around uh, uh, the specific forms that political cinema in Britain took during the 1980s. Um, we were especially interested in, in works which were screened in Britain on Channel 4 within the remit of the independent film and video department. Um, so within um, the People to People strand and the 11th Hour strand, which were two important strands during the 1980s, um, 
we, uh, we became interested in specific films. So the films in key words were all screened within the 11th hour strand. And then the national interest was screened within the people to people strand. And, uh, and we, we um, John O'Confer of Black Audio Film Collective lent us a book called The Work of Channel 4's Independent Film and Video Department, which showed nearly all those productions that were broadcast between 82 and 86. And we went through that volume looking for the films that intrigued us. And one of the films that caught our attention was this work called In the National Interest. We were struck because we, we hadn't heard of this work and because it, in, in, its, in the questions it put, it seemed to uh, open up and to suggest a moment of coalition building within British political television. It seemed to us that the types of political cinema that had been formulated during the 70s had opened up a space within television. They had won the argument for a television that spoke to new social movements, for a television that was both local and community oriented, and spoke to the promise of transnational coalitions. And perhaps the years of 82 to 86 uh, were, were the high point of those years of progressive intervention. In which case then, in the national interest became one example of what that might mean. And precisely because we had not seen it, nor heard of it, the film uh, became more and more interesting to us now as an example of the kinds of continuities and discontinuities between the middle, middle of the 80s and the present. So we, we wanted to find an excuse to re-encounter this work and to help this question and, to, and, and for this film to help us understand the differences between then and now. Um, so digging further into this volume, we discovered um, a biography of chapter video workshops. I'm going to read a bit of that biography, then I'm going to uh, go on to read um, a bit of Penny Stemple's biography that we've gathered both from her website and from the British Film Institute website. And then that all being done, we'll hand over to Penny to introduce the film. So, so in August 1986, um, this is how Chapter Video Workshop described itself. Chapter Video was originally set up in 1974 and was one of the first community video workshops in Britain. In 1984, with new funding from Channel 4, the workshop became enfranchised under the workshop declaration. Chapter Video produces a range of programmes stemming from its relationship both with various communities and local authorities in Wales and with the independent sector throughout Britain. Over the last two years, the workshop has been concerned with many of the economic and cultural issues thrown up by the 1984 to 85 coal dispute. Do you pronounce this Sabre or Caver? C-E-I-B-E-R. Kyber. Kyber, yeah. excuse me. Kyber, the greatest improvisers in the world, won the 1986 Pasco McFarlane Award for progressive filmmaking. The workshop has had three of its programs broadcast since 1984, Rumours at the Miners' Fortnight, In the National Interest, and Kyber. Since enfranchisement, the workshop's role as an access point to broadcast television has been developed alongside the production of non-broadcast educational and campaign programmes. The workshop is important to other producers and community groups in South Wales who use the facilities at subsidised rates. Much of this work relies on grant, aid and commissions from state agencies. All the videos, workshops, productions reflect a commitment to making programmes with rather than about people and encourage a wider understanding of the media's role in shaping knowledge and attitudes about social and cultural issues. So that, that emphasis on social practice and on collective practice and on making films with rather than about, I think that, that encapsulates a certain, um, a certain kind of ethos and a certain kind of ethics and a certain kind of politics of that moment. So if we cut to the present, um, and if we cut to Penny's uh, biography, then um, we'll just read a section of that. It says, Penny Stemple began work in community media. She started with radio, where she worked at Cardiff Broadcasting Corporation as an outreach worker, training people within the community to make their own radio programmes, 
which were then broadcast on CBC, a commercial radio station. From there, Stemple went on to work in video, film and television, with Chapter Video Workshop, Chapter Film Workshop, the South Wales Women's Film Group, who were the first women's film organisation in Wales, who were formed with the intention of sharing skills, supporting ideas and enabling women to play a more active part in filmmaking, and also to work with Red Flannel Films, Deep Sea Wales and Channel 4 Television. Chapter Video Workshop were famous for working with minors to make campaign videos such as The Case for Coal, putting the striker's point of view. And with Red Flannel Films in 1986, films such as Ma'am from 1988 and Special Delivery from 1991 uncovered the domestic and public histories of Welsh women, investigating their role and status in the family, the labour market, reproduction, women's organisation and political parties. And that's from Emma Herditch's really useful introduction to the work of Penny Stemple on the British Film Institute website. So having gathered this information from different sources, um, there's a certain sense in which um, we're very much honoured to have Penny herself, who can speak to the fault lines, the tensions and the complexities of these moments in a way that these texts perhaps tend to maybe, maybe ameliorate. And that's something we want to touch on after the screening. But um, having gone through these frames of introduction, it's, uh, it's now our, our real honour to hand over to Penny, who will at last um, give us a kind of an introduction to In the National Interest itself. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming along, Penny. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Kojo and I have had a, a brief pre-chat, and I said to Kojo, he's so much better at talking about it than I am. So, But anyway, um, I was thrilled and amazed to be asked to um, come and screen and talk about in the national interest because, um, as I said to Kojo, I couldn't believe anyone was still interested in it. So, so yeah, that, that was really nice. Um, it, if I give a very brief introduction now, because then we'll go into all these points um, in more detail. Um, but as Kojo's already said, really, um, I think in the national interest is very much a product of that very precise moment for just all sorts of reasons when everything had sort of come together and grown and developed and actually was about to sort of burst and fall apart, I think. Um, and, um, you know, I think in many ways in the national interest failed. I think it's also fantastically successful, politically at least. Um, but having said that, as I've mentioned to Kojo, we were very heavily censored. So what we set out to do wasn't what we ended up broadcasting, which was a massive disappointment um, because we put a radical proposal to Channel 4 and during the making of the film, um, Channel 4 was beginning to come under political pressure and so we were editing with um, Caroline Spry in the edit suite saying, you can't put that in, you can't put that in. So um, to our minds, we turned out something very sort of mushy that didn't have the politics we intended at all. But nonetheless, we, I had to go on right to reply because it was considered so radical. So, you know, it must have, it must have done something, I suppose. Um, it grew out specifically, the programme itself, um, we were making campaign tapes during the miners' strike um, and Chris Rushton and I, who co-directed in the National Interest, had made um, two campaign tapes, The Case for Coal, and um, whose law, the case for coal, was an economic argument for why the mines should be kept open, and whose law concentrated on the use of the law against miners. Um, and they were both sort of quite hard, gritty tapes, and they went around and they were used for fundraising and campaigning. And also with the um, South Wales Women's Film Group I made, um, a campaign tape with miners' wives called Something Else in the House, and the title came Three Amazing Women, Miners' Wives, who gave us a fantastic interview, um, and one of them said that during the miners' strike, um, their husbands had come to realise they didn't just have a wife in the house, they had something else in the house, um, which was a great quote, so that's why that was called Something Else in the House. So we were busy doing all of that. The great thing about... Um, the workshops then was that they were totally accessible. If you were interested in film, you could go in, you could you know, grab a camera, book it out, do whatever you wanted, use the edit suites. 
Um, so when the miners' strike, I, I was working community radio, as Kojo said, when the miners' strike started, I just got totally involved in making campaign tapes, just, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and a lot of us were doing that all around Britain. Um, and um, should I go into... Yeah, so I suppose I'll, I'm going on a bit now, so I'll go into... There's a whole thing about the independent sector and how many workshops, in fact, it was all around Britain, so there's all that as well, but maybe I, maybe I should sort of not go on too much now. Um, but Channel 4, Alan Fountain and Caroline Spry were sort of going around looking at the campaign tapes. They came to chapter and um, looked at Case for Colin, whose law and particularly liked them and wanted us to go on and do something from those for television. Um, and because we'd just done Who's Law, what we wanted to do was broaden out that whole issue of how um, the law is politicised and how struggles of all kinds are um, politicised so that, um, you know, if you, if you criminalise a struggle, you take the sting out of it, basically. Um, and we wanted to broaden that and look back historically and um, just look at that question. So that's what we put to Channel 4, and, and they liked that idea. And in the national interest was this idea of the fact that, you know, during the miners' strike or just generally during any sort of moment of opposition, the national interest is brought in as an argument. Um, there was a whole question in the miners' strike of the enemy within, which was, you know, Thatcher's um, description of those people that were, you know, either miners or on the side of the miners or workers or whatever, so, um, which we weren't allowed to mention in, in the national interest. Um, so we looked at the, the concept of in the national interest, who it includes, who it excludes, and how the law is used to criminalise dissent, basically. Shall I, I'll stop there, and we'll go into the Absolutely. sort of ge geography afterwards. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay, then. Well, so I think... I just wanted to say one thing. Before we screen the film, I just would like to thank Tessa, Jackson and Grant for um, hosting this event at right. Innova. Okay, yeah. and then just two more things. Mm. Um, uh, I think um, what we're going to see is... a. Uh, is a DVD of a VHS uh, that was in Penny's uh, possession. Um, the master tapes uh, that um, British Film Institute have are prohibitively expensive uh, for telesinian, and so we took the decision to go with the, the VHS that Penny had, and not to apologize for that, but to reflect on that as, as a condition of production that exists now. So, um, so that's, that's, that explains both the sound and the image quality of what we're about to see. And um, I think, you know, a month after Thatcher's death, I can't think of a better moment to screen this film. So, um, yeah, thank you for bringing that film along. It was uh, really, um, it's a powerful experience for, for, uh, for many reasons. Um, uh, I mean, when we look at it, it returns us to this just to the, uh, the aftermath of the minor strike. So this moment after 84, 85. So the moment when the, the Thatcherite response to the minor strike then opens up a fault line that runs through, it seems, all kinds of different flashpoints. So that there's this particular strike and there's this particular campaign that is mobilised around that. Um, and the film seems to take this moment as a, as a point at which to follow various threads and, the, and to build up a, something like a, 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 a cinema of coalition so that the minor strike itself galvanises people. But then in the aftermath of that, the film then tries to link up to other struggles that are happening. So we see the moment of, um, of uh, the Newham Seven, which is earlier. Mm. Um, and then we see uh, what strikes us, we see what we call um, you know, demonstrations, marches, these moments of public protest culture, which are summoned up from different points in the geography of the British islands. So we journey to, Der journey to Amar, and then we're in Pontypridd, then we're in Stoke Newington, <laughs> local, locally um, defined Stoke Newington, and we're moving between 83, we're moving between 85, 84, 87, so on one, 86. So on one hand, 
we have this geography of resistance which comes out of this initial coalition. And then on the other hand, we also have this moment back to the Chartist struggles on one hand and then the suffragette struggles on the other hand. So we also have um, a historical memory of resistance and of struggle for rights which are summoned at this moment of danger. So this moment of history is summoned because the present is a moment of danger. And it's at this point that the moment of memory is summoned up. Um, and I guess um, what's really um, intriguing for us is that, is, that, um, is that a particular kind of workshop video can see itself as a, as a cinema of coalition building. So that this, this film, it's not that this film does all of this by itself. On the contrary, this film is explicit in, in building up lines of association with other filmmakers, with other workshops, and integrating their footage in order to build this film. So that at the end, we see a credit where, um, where we say, uh, with material used from, and then there's this list. A, a B, S, C, Film and Video, Activision Studios, Albany Video, Another View, Belfast Independent Video, Bias Tapes, Black Audio Film Collective, Day Film and Video Collective, Faction Films, Films at Work, Open Eye, Sankofa, Sheffield Asian Film and Video, Trade Films, TUTV, Women in Sync. And right there, that's an entire cultural movement that, that this film positions itself within. And that's really fascinating for us, the moment at which a film practice, which belongs to a movement, is, is also simultaneously linked to an inseparable from a political moment. So, I mean, that's, that's the kind of overview of, of like what brought us into this and what fascinates us about this film. But I wondered if you could, if you could um, talk us a bit, talk us through a bit, this, um, the production history and how it was that, that Chapter Video and yourself and Chris Rushing came to um, such an ambitious notion of assembling a film from material and assembling a film that would simultaneously move through a geography of resistance and through uh, a kind of a history of resistance uh, which is as much is as much sonic as it is visual. I wonder if you could talk just a bit about about that production process. Okay, um, as you said, it was very ambitious, and I think, yeah, I, I think this moment in the independent sector, a lot of people were trying to go from their sort of local community and their small campaign tape to trying to sort of cope with bigger funds, television, different production values. Um, and I think a lot of people faltered at that point and it was in many ways too ambitious, but we had, um, with the case for Cole and Whose Law, um, which we made earlier as campaign tapes, we had already begun to bring in material from other workshops. So we'd started that process in a small way. Um, at that time, the independent sector, um, there was the Independent Filmmakers Association, which then became the Independent Film and Video um, Association. Um, and there were workshops all around Britain. S there weren't many franchised workshops. Chapter was a franchised workshop, but... Maybe you could explain the distinction yeah. for people. Um, so Channel 4 broadcast for the first time November 1982, and we had a party in Cardiff and all sat and admired it and watched, mm. what was it, um, that comedy thing. Anyway, whatever. Um, young Ones. Or young Ones, yeah, yeah. Mm. That, that group, yeah. Mm. So, so Channel 4 started in November 1982. Um, what had been fought for, which Kojo referred to earlier, was there were a lot of small workshops all around Britain with people trying to make their own films, trying to bring a new voice, trying to represent their own community, as you referred to already, making films and videos with people, not about people, so um, yeah, a different, a different way of working. Um, but most of the workshops were very underfunded, hardly funded at all, which obviously compromised what people could do and what people could make, and also compromised the visibility, so it's very different if you're making you know, a little 15-minute film for your local community, which is seen by the people that 
were interested in the first place. And obviously, if you want to reach a wider audience, if you want to bring your points and that voice to a wider audience, you need access to television, you need access to more funds. So the franchise workshops, um, that was a model that um, came with Channel 4, which meant that <coughs> if um, Alan Fountain's department, the independent commissioning department, considered the workshops work interesting enough, they would fund that workshop for three years mm. um, and you would get proper wages. So you were actually able to work properly, work over a decent period of time and produce something that could be seen on television and reach a wider audience and bring those different voices. Um, and that's really what Alan Fountain's department was looking for. It was looking for those voices that otherwise wouldn't be heard. Um, so um, chapter workshop came from a Welsh perspective and you know, very much represented the miners of the South Wales Valley. Um, Red Flannel that I was um, found a member of was specifically representing women's voices from the South Wales Valley. Um, and I think it comes over, when I looked at in the national interest again, prior to showing it here, I was, I was struck by, it seems to me, you do have a very different feel. Those voices do come through very directly because everybody speaking in, in, in the national interest um, has been filmed by people that have worked within that community for a long time. There's a lot of trust between the person interviewing and on camera and the people they're talking to, so you, you get that sort of directness. Um, so, to go back to the independent sector, the IFA, later IFBA, um, there were, I don't know, 25 or more workshops throughout Britain, all with a very similar agenda, all wanting to represent their community. Some were franchised, some weren't. Um, and we met regularly, and um, in the interests of geographical fairness, we'd go around Britain and we'd meet in different places. Um, so, you know, we'd all sort of traipse to North Wales and, you know, then we'd be back in London and then we'd be in Sheffield or whatever and we'd all sort of, you know, go around Britain um, to be fair to everybody. And it was, um, it was a very committed community. I think people trusted each other very well, had a, you know, the, wanted to do the same sort of thing. Um, so when we came to consider making the, in the national interest, what we did was we reached out to all the other workshops and we asked them if we could have footage from them. And some of it was archive footage, which is why it goes back historically, because these workshops had been following the struggles in their community for years. Um, and so we were able to tap into their archive footage. And some of the material was shot specifically for in the national interest. So, um, yeah, some of it was old footage. Some of it we actually said to people, could you go out? This is the subject that we're covering, could you find people that can talk to that subject? Um, and some of the people we went out and inter interviewed ourselves, um, Joe Sim, Gareth Pierce. Um. <coughs> and so we didn't really know what footage we were going to get back. Um, and um, there was a huge amount of it and an awful lot to wade through. Um, very hard work. Um, it took a lot of trust from those people because they just delivered us their material and we just went through it and edited it. Um, particularly the Northern Irish workshops, we had to go through quite a process to get them to trust us in the first place and give us their material. Um, they were very wary of that, but they did trust us to do it. Um, so, yeah, so we... We, you know, we sent out a plea for material, we got it all back in, and then we just ploughed through it all and, and selected it. Um, so the plus point is you get those raw voices. I think it comes over as very unmediated, um, and I like that rawness, and I think it comes over very much of its time. Um, I think it was in many ways a bit too ambitious, and so I'm not sure that it all quite hangs together. Um, but yeah, does that answer? Yeah. Some of it? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Angelina? Yeah, um, I mean, what's um, key in the film is the way in which political culture, public pr pr processional culture, the protest, is connected with and part of a larger political, independent film and video culture of collective practice. 
And I mean, I, th I think one of the things for me that was striking um, in reflection uh, and in comparison to the present is the question of race and the image that's inclusive of many different uh, bodies and faces. Um, and to have a black lawyer, you know, presenting, a, you know, and I liked the, the, the kind of, um, the kind of tableau, <laughs> you know, on the table. Um, that was filmed by um, Isaac Julian, which is why. Oh, that's so, it's got more voice. aesthetizes. Yeah. I could hear yeah. him. I could yeah, hear yeah. him saying. It's, <laughs> it's a pity because you don't, mm. I mean, in fact, some mm. of that did look mm. quite lush. Mm. Um, and one of the things, you know, if, if, if I could have, track down the broadcast quality version, you would have seen a real difference in the production values because some of it was really just kind of agitprop, just somebody that had happened to be out, you know, when a procession was going on and had a camera and some of it was very sort of gritty and scratchy and then some of it, is, you know, as I said, Isaac Julian filmed some of it mm. and it looked beautiful. It was just an interview, yeah. but, you know, Courtney Griffiths looked mm. gorgeous, um, yeah. but you can't see that here because, because it's mm. just taken off a VHS, but, but the material was very... Um, varied in its val you know, production values and, and mm. quality. But yes, that was Isaac Julian, so mm. <laughs> didn't it look nice? And even yeah. in the VHS, you noticed it. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, just the, yeah. Um, the kind of rolls of paper and the yeah, yeah. books mm. kind of piled up on the, it was all very staged. Yeah. 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 yeah, this is very interesting. But I mean, the question of race is present there. The mm. kind of st mm. racial struggle is mm. kind of present. Um, and, you know, you go from kind of representing these different positions to uh, from the minors and yeah, all these political positions, and then into the criminalization of racial groups, um, in a way that's kind of, you know, um, you know, fantastic. Because actually, for us growing up in that time, to see kind of that being attended to, was you know very very important in the kind of formation of us as. Uh, Asian or as uh, Afro-Caribbeans growing up at that time. So when television was a kind of platform where race was discussed, where colonization was being unpacked and attended to, um, I'm just kind of interested in, because it's funny to see Imran Khan and uh, Gareth Pierce who have both gone on to, I mean, um, Imran Khan went on to uh, uh, you know, work on behalf of Doreen Lawrence and the Lawrence family and Gareth mm. Pierce is, mm. you know, working on Mega. behalf of... Yeah, she keeps going you know, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Guantanamo and, yeah, Bay yeah, and yeah. Um, Hamja Hassan's yeah, brother, Kala yeah. Hassan, and, um, mm. you know, many other people who, where, you know, the criminalization has just exceeded all kind of imagination mm. in terms of what's mm. going on mm. now. Um, so, you know, in terms of this kind of moment, you know, clearly these kinds of workshops don't exist, these kinds of collectives. For instance, even though we call ourselves a collective, I mean, there's no kind of, I mean, there's not many others who, there's not many like black, we, we, we attend to and we keep our relations with different groups all over the world, but in this way it didn't, um, ex it doesn't exist. Um, and I think part of this event this evening is to begin to reconstruct these moments in order to get a sense of the continuities and discontinuities between then and now. And I'm just interested in how you would reflect on the present in relation this I don't know. I, I mean, Kojo and I were talking about that earlier, and I was, I was trying mm -hmm. to think about that. I mean, I felt a real nostalgia because I, mm -hmm. I think what comes over still, and I think we were trying to avoid having too much of that militant footage because when we made in the national interest, there'd been a lot of that and the campaign tapes and the marches, and there was so much of it, we were trying to mm -hmm. steer away from that. And now I wish we'd had more because I miss it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it looks fantastic and that real sort of feeling that comes with it. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, the workshops and the whole collective thing. And I don't know. I mean, in a way, I'd sort of want to throw that to sort of younger people that are here and sort of ask, you know, how that would work now. Because I think, I mean, it struck me some of the footage there. Now people would be just getting that on their mobile phones, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you wouldn't require a whole collective to say, you know, we need a camera, we need a microphone, you know, we're all going to go down on this particular day book the equipment out, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't even just, you don't physically need that yeah. collective in a way, do you? You just need someone who happens to be there with a mobile phone. And, mm -hmm. and so the whole sort of logistics are different and um, the whole networking thing is so different. And mm. I don't know, I don't know sort of how it, um, how it translates really. Well, maybe we can. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've, I've got one more question which kind of speaks to that in a, in a roundabout way. And then maybe we could open it out because it's a it's a key moment to hold on to and um, but I think it's a it's an, it's a it's a complex question to ask 
but maybe a way to return to it slightly differently is to is to um, is to if if we listen to the film as much as watch it. I, I realized after my second or third viewing that the um, the the role of the soundtrack is mm. key. Mm -hmm. There's a, a continuous summoning of of a, a kind of uh, sonic memories of Englishness mm -hmm. and even specifically film filmic quotations of mm. sonic Englishness. Mm. So there's continually sounds of um, of cricket, of the the the, the sound of a of a ball hitting a bat, mm. the particular sound of applause, which you mm. hear on the village green, mm -hmm. where the applause travels across the leveled green. There's the particular tonality and timbre of a, of, of a tennis commentator saying mm. deuce. Mm. There's um, particular kinds of swing music, which mm. sound like they're coming through a radio. It's not just swing, but it's swing heard through a radio. The kind of thing you might hear in uh, Humphrey Jennings' "Listen to Britain." There's a uh, there's the sound of telephone beeps. There's this continual summoning of 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 a kind of spectral Englishness at the level of sound, um, uh, which I find really um, quite appealing, actually. But in in the film, they, there's a, they're continually placed. Uh, on one hand, there's these spectres of Englishness, which uh, which are always understood as excluding. And then there's the images which summon up different communities of resistance in and against that. But then you have Stafford Scott, and Stafford Scott is the figure who says, mm, who references mm, mm. these old English films. Mm. And, the, and you, you wonder, well, which films is he talking about? Is he talking <laughs> about you know, Kind Hearts and Coronets? Is he talking about the Lady Killers? He talks about these old English movies and mm. the sense of community in them and how how, most, how he wants, to yeah, and how he he would like that. So he's not summoning up like a super super um, super militant film about um, about reggae and sound systems. He's talking about old English movies, the same movies that it it feels like are being summoned up just for moments at mm, a time, mm. like ten seconds at a time, twenty seconds at a time, and then they're vanishing. Mm. And it's as if he's. It's as if so at that moment... So he's wanting to belong to yeah, that national and interest, exactly. in fact. And yeah. it's as if yeah, at that not moment... Not to be excluded. Yeah. Exactly. At, the, yeah. at that moment, um, his desires and those sounds meet. Like there's a, a meeting made just at that moment. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about the, um, the work on sound, because I think it's extremely elaborated. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes... But you, you have to be really listening to mm. hear the sounds and then to hear the recurrence to hear how they return over and over again and how they work with something like the dissolving the way in which there's a continuous dissolving to, to something like a vellum frontispiece yes. or a marble, yeah. a marble face, a marble facade. I thought facade, it was like clouds. Which comes and goes. I wondered if you could talk, in other words, if you could talk a bit about the, the clear importance that, that you gave certain signatures they're doing a lot of the emotional work of the yeah. film. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about that aspect. Yes. Um, well, as I was saying, because at that point we were trying to move beyond just the campaign tape and, you know, branch out to... We were... I think a lot of people in the sector were looking for a new form of television and a new, a new way of presenting things and a new language. Um, so we were trying to move away from just the sort of agitprop, militant, just the, you know, the marches and the talking heads and the interviews, um, and trying to find some new language. So, yes, the sound was very important. We actually commissioned Simon Robert Shaw to do a soundtrack. Who was um, Simon Robert Shaw? He's gone on... I mean, it's quite interesting because, you know, a lot of people within that film have gone on to do all sorts of interesting stuff. He, he was... Um, <laughs> an artist who went on to do all sorts of really interesting work um, and a lot of work with sound. Um, and, um, yeah, so, so we actually asked him to um, create and um, produce a soundtrack for us and we gave him a sort of list of sounds that we thought would evoke the national interest, you know, the, the Joe Sim list of... Um, the country church or the cricket, the mm. tennis, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we met with Simon, we talked to him, and together we came up with a list of what we thought would constitute 
the sounds of the national interest. And then he went away and he produced a soundtrack. And then, and then we used it throughout um, the film. Um, and yes, we had accompanying images, but we didn't probably have enough um, in that an awful lot of the effort went into just the political material. And, and so really we could have done, I think, with commissioning people to go and get the images, to go with the soundtrack. But um, that didn't happen sufficiently. So yes, things like the sort of cloudy image, I mean, that was just a piece of paper that we yeah. kind of you know, zoomed <laughs> into and blurred, which seems a bit mad now, but that's, that's what it was. And, and yes, the idea was to have this sort of subliminal subconscious reference all the time to the national interest um, and the return to the Union Jack and all those images that are in our subconscious, you know, and that, as Courtney Griffith says, you know, when you get to a crisis like, you know, the Falklands or whatever, then immediately the, the national consciousness can be rallied around these notions that everybody's attached to, even Stafford Scott, you know. Um, because they've got this nostalgic value and everybody loves them and nobody wants them to be disturbed. And um, yes, so we were trying to sort of work those at a sort of subconscious level, I suppose. Um, yeah, I find that fascinating to like how you would build in a moment of reverie into a film which is, which is uh, designed around um, urgency and, and vigilance and alertness and um, um, a sense of communities under attack and communities having to find a way of defending and rallying themselves, but then simultaneously trying to find forms and aesthetics for reverie and for a certain kind of dreaming with your eyes open. Like these moments of the dissolve, that's mm. what I see them as, a kind of wide-eyed dreaming that mm. the film I suppose that's what you're fighting against, <laughs> really, isn't it? So you have to summon it. Th those moments of sort of breakout yeah. struggle. Yes exist within that cloudy, dreamy subconscious yeah. and, and they have to sort of fight their way out of it because that's so... And as, as Joe S Sim said, you know, that can always be summoned. Um, mm. And I think it's interesting, having looked at it in the national interest from the perspective of now, how the focus changes. So, I mean, now Courtney Griffith specifically mentions um, that it's all about colour. But in fact, now, of course, it's the whole East European thing, isn't it? So, so it shifts, you know, and it goes to Muslims, and now it's East Europeans. But I was also thinking that UKIP, interestingly, it's not quite enough for Nigel Farage to complain about Romanians and Bulgarians. He has to specify it's the Roma. You know, so you, you, you sort of always have that. But, but the focus actually shifts. And even the national interest changes its shape in that now homosexuality is sort of brought in. You know, it was in a quote, and now that's been, you know, gays and lesbians, and you know, that's all within our national interest and gay marriage and everything. So, so everything changes, but you've still got this notion of national interest, and you've still got excluded groups. It's just they shift against each other. Um, because the national interest is a, is a colonial fantasy that, that can, be, uh, can be desired and summoned and that the film, cinematically speaking, the film itself has to evoke it in order to work around um, a cinema that vanquishes it. The so cinema has to find an audiovisual means of bringing it into appearance, even as the film also summons up uh, the kinds of, um, the kinds of uh, means of vanquishing it. And uh, it's as if, uh, it's as if, uh, Everybody in the film is a warrior who's, uh, who's, who has to continually guard against sleep, against the, against the sleep of Englishness. They continually <laughs> have to wake themselves up from this sleep, like the, like the Shelley poem about... Well, it's, yeah, Shelley, like, lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. That's the scritty politi. Yeah, scritty politi via Shelley. OK. OK. Clearly, we can talk for ages. So let's, um, but let's open it up to the audience and then we can, uh, let's uh, uh, have, have a conversation. If people have thoughts, uh, responses um, uh, that they want to put to Penny about any aspects of the film, about these kinds of continuities and discontinuities between then and now, and about her practice then and now, then, um, yeah, over to you. Margaret. <coughs> Can you tell us a bit more about what was censored? Because 
Um, I was very interested in that. I think it's um, one of the interesting forgotten lessons that that moment of Channel 4 gave us um, was how uh, great the censorship of television was and how invisible it had been before and afterwards <coughs> because um, people who came up through um, conventional television were kind of trained. And it wasn't just political, it was also a whole range of stylistic, a whole kind of things. So that with the kind of changes that happened in Channel 4, um, round about the time you were making that and about the time I was doing my series, um, but some people came in who, had, who came more from that world and who um, reacted completely shocked to the idea that even certain things could have been thought to go out because they'd been trained in this kind of censorship. So I'm very interested if you can name some of the specific things which were censored. Um, yes. What I, I think, broadly speaking, what we weren't allowed to do in any shape or form was to be too specific about Thatcher, Thatcher's government, what Thatcher had done. So that rather cramped our style because that's where we started out from. Um, so, um, and having shown Alan Fountain and Caroline Spry Who's Law, which was very specific, um, yeah, and we'd gathered material in with the intention of being very specific. So, you know, specifically naming, you know, you know, what laws had been used and when and, you know, why that was unjust and all that sort of thing. And so it was very much that that we had to cut out, which is why, why to my mind, it seems a bit bland and some of the points made seem a bit obvious because we weren't actually allowed to move in and get sort of, you know, sharp or gritty or specific. Um, so, um, yeah, and, I mean, particularly Gareth Pierce, we had to cut a lot of... Gareth Pierce's um, contribution because she was giving us a lot of those very specific sort of human rights points. Um, so, you know, we, we were barely able to use her at all and um, I actually had to phone up and confess to her from the online edit and felt terrible. Mm. <laughs> you know, I phoned her up and said, look, you know, we've been made to cut a lot of your contribution and she being Gareth Pierce said, oh, but we can fight that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of say, oh, well, actually, um, given it's got to be finished in about an hour. Um, yeah. But we did actually have, you know, Caroline Spry actually came and watched the material with us and, you know, specified that's, that's you know, you, you can't say that and you can't say that. And, and it was really any, it, it was because at that point the government was, cons it, it wasn't people within Channel 4, it was actually, you know, government diktat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was actually Channel 4 being told to toe the line um, and to show more balance. And I mean, obviously, our programme wasn't balanced, um, but, but it was yes, toned. Her down. name is never mentioned, I noticed. Yeah. Has <coughs> made, there's a Anyone else? Up here? Yeah. Here comes the microphone. I have a I went to the Channel 4 conference last year at the BFI and um, it was quite surprising that censorship wasn't mentioned once. Uh, about, you know, it was, it was talking about how positive it, what Channel 4 film was, and which it, in a sense is true, but I was really shocked that censorship wasn't mentioned. Um, I work with Ken Loach's archive and in 1983 he had done a four-part series called Questions of Leadership. Um, for Channel 4, and that didn't go out at all. Um, and it's still, Ken himself hasn't got copies of this. So, and this kind of thing wasn't mentioned at all. And it, it's still, even today, there is some su mm. suppression of this side of Channel 4 from that period. Mm. Mm, you know, anyway. Yeah, they don't have any, are they, I mean, we've tried to locate lots of material through Channel 4 and they just don't have a record of any of, there's no archive basically of any of that material. Mm. They haven't kept it. Mm. Hi. Yeah. Um, I feel amazing. And to see what sort of, what it may have represented as kind of an audit or like the, the, the kind of other side of, of a 
more traditional like news uh, broadcast, like I, I really thought of him. And I was I was wondering what the sort of fallout was. I think you suggested before in before the the, the film started that there was some kind of it, it it created some kind of controversy and you were brought into uh, another program and I just wanted to ask a little bit about the kind of aftermath and then also I think you said uh, the, Nor uh, the Northern Irish film archive was quite contentious and uh, like I'm just interested in sort of what that provoked both within Channel 4 and also the sort of constituencies with which you, you worked or, or collaborated. Um, yeah, in terms of the people we collaborated with I think they were all very happy that there was no, the, the issue with Northern Ireland was before they actually agreed to work with us. So that was right at the beginning where we asked them, would you give us material? And they wanted to make sure that we would use it properly and could be trusted and that sort of thing. And um, so that, that was gone through right at the beginning of the process. Um, and they were very happy with what we did. And so, that, so there wasn't any issue from any of the workshops that contributed material to us. Um, which was great, really, because there were 17 of them, you know, and we were just working in Cardiff all on our own. They didn't, at any point, none of the workshops came while we were editing to see what we were doing. Um, so it's testimony to the fact that it was a very united sector, really, in that way. Um, and, um, yeah, everybody was very happy with it. Um, in terms of um, Channel 4 and any response there, um, I think, you know, it, it was the programme that got the most response that week. It got the most people phoning in and, and making comment, um, which was the way Right to Reply used to work. So there was a programme every week called Right to Reply where programmes that had been on during the week were, you know, discussed or, or whatever. And so because it had the most people phoning in to Channel 4 in the national interest got to be featured in Right to Reply. Um, and... Um, yeah, I, I, I was wheeled out with, with a woman who, it turned out, had only watched about five minutes of the programme and had become so enraged that she'd phoned in. Um, and she, um, she's, you know, sort of English rose from the Shire somewhere. And um, I was pitted against her and um, had a dreadful time, actually. But uh, they thought it was marvellous television. And I think in terms of Channel 4, they were, you know, they, it was seen as a, as a success just because it generated controversy and attention and um, you know there wasn't a problem in that sense you know no, nobody was bothered beyond the fact that it was on right to reply and that was seen as a success I think for the department because it had got a lot of audience response and that's a good thing. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else? Any more responses? Aidy. <coughs> What, what, what I find really odd in a way about this question of censorship is in a way is the extent to which it shows the limits of Channel 4 even by then and the mm. kind of illusions people had about it because NCCL, the National Council for Civil Liberties, ran a very, very vigorous campaign against the criminal law. I mean, immensely vigorous and much more political than what you were allowed to say, apparently. Mm, mm. Because you have to name specific laws, you have mm, to name specific mm. ministers, mm. you have to go into deep legal detail mm, in it. Mm. And, and that was running all over the country at that time as well. So there's a way in which one might think of Channel 4 as actually having subverted some kind of resistance to that. But at the same time, one of the things I find refreshing about it is as a positive effect of the censorship, if you like, is that it's not over-invested in Thatcher. Because in my view, the left, in general, spent mm. a lot too much time rushing around shouting Maggie, 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 and out, 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 until they were mm. completely dependent on her. It was, it was a terrible piece of hegemonic <coughs> resistance, if you like, the investment in Thatcher. So in, in that sense, there's a much clearer view without her yeah, so for yeah, me, the yeah. whole thing is very ambivalent that way. Mm, mm. On the one hand, it's disappointing. On the other hand, it's refreshing. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, looking at it from the perspective now, I'd, I'd agree with you because it makes it a more lasting statement. And obviously, it's an endlessly ongoing and shifting process, the whole, the whole thing. So, 
So yes, from, from this perspective, I'd agree with you, it is, it is better, but still a little bit woolly, I think, but mm. yeah. <laughs> Sylvia? Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this film. I, I was just wondering if you can tell us something more about uh, what you did afterwards, whether you carried on with collective projects and uh, how you developed your practice. Um, and yeah, I, I sort of did different things. And um, I think, as I, as I was saying earlier, that it was a very sort of particular moment in the independent <coughs> sector when I think people, you know, people were trying to sort of adjust to the new funding and all that sort of thing. And, and also, it sort of fell apart a little bit, I think, after that moment. And people began to sort of pursue different strands of, of what they were interested in. And um, I think, you know, some people went more towards art filmmaking. Some people, you know, sort of kept the political thing going. Other people just headed for television. Um, and um, just, you know, sort of made fairly standard television, really. Um, so in a sense, that moment was a springboard for, for careers that parted and went in different directions. Some people went into, you know, academic careers, education. Um, I sort of, I, I made a fiction film and arts with Arts Council funding. Um, Directly after making in, in the in the national interest, that was when we set up Red Flannel Films. Um, so I went into Red Flannel. Um, I worked on feature films. Um, I worked on a film about my father, um, who had just died, and my father was um, Austrian Jewish, and I didn't know very much about his background. So um, I started working on a, on a film about that. Um, I think probably. That moment, sort of, for a lot of people, the sector began to fall apart. The IFEA began to fall apart, really. <coughs> um, and um, people began to try and find out what their own particular interest was. Um, well, why? Could you say more about why it fell apart? Is it both internal pressures and external pressures? Because. Um, in the in the history books, I've often read that it's it's actually around nineteen it's around um, ninety two that the sector undergoes quite yeah I, I think changes. it I think it did sort of the but momentum is, did yeah. carry on um, I'd agree with that um, but you're I, saying even in eight, even around eighty six eighty seven you're saying already already the 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 uh, exodus from collective practice is 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 underway. I think, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably, that's probably, I'm not being quite accurate there because I did go into red flannel then and, and so, yeah, probably your timing on 1990 issues is more accurate. Um, I mean, for myself, I, I think that, you know, collective working can be very difficult um, and can throw up a lot of problems. And in, in the heat of a moment like the miners' strike, mm. that's when everybody really is focused on the same thing. And um, the urgency of the moment brings that whole thing together, and it works fantastically well, you know, to the extent you can bring in 18 different workshops and want to say the same thing at the same time um, and trust two people to edit it for everybody and everyone's happy, you know, so, so, so there's that moment. Um, but I think collective working can be quite difficult and can hide a lot of problems and, you know, can just lead to sort of hidden hierarchies, mm -hmm. which are more pernicious than, you know, an overt hierarchy. So for myself, I would say that that became a bit problematic. And, and the cracks within the sector showed up um, in the way that, it, you know, they often do. Um, so you've got disagreements, you know, for instance, you know, it, between Wales and England or, you know, be between particular ways of going about things or, or what the best way to represent people was and, um, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. Can I ask you a <laughs> question there? I think one striking thing is a very recent moment is that we've become more and more aware what 
of corporatism in British society, if you like, and what it means to have corporations like the BBC. And in my view, I think ACTT was such a corporation. And that I was wondering if you, of all those 17 inputs, were they all footage made by permission of ACTT? Adrian, can you say what ACTT is? The Association for the of Cinematic of and Something <coughs> Television Technicians. And, you know, because the students whom I taught, I mean, the first ambition they had before they could do anything in life was to get their ACTT mm, card. Mm, mm. And it was a deeply reactionary union. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I wonder how that... It's very rule-bound and very high-bound, yeah. Yeah, and, and mm. exclusive. His mm, main mm, aim was mm. to stop people making films. Mm. And um, <coughs> I, I wonder how we feel about that now, if you think that something... Well, gets yeah... I'd agree with that, and, and it was a very sort of rigid and old-fashioned way of working, and it was, as you say, very exclusive. Um, and I think that was exploded. I suppose that's another reason why things changed so much. That was exploded by the bringing in of independence to the BBC and the whole sort of movement towards independence, mm. and just by technology, really. You know, because you, you couldn't anymore say nobody else is allowed to pick up a camera, but, you know, the the camera man as it usually was then because you know one person suddenly could do everything so the whole union thing began to fall apart I think partly because of the technology um, but m a lot of the participants in, in this film weren't ACTT they were just you know a collection of individuals that had come together to make films um, and they weren't unionized and um, yeah you know, they weren't in franchise workshop so um, so probably the majority of, of that footage wasn't from ACTT members. Mm. I think Margaret has a... Uh, I think that should be... ...wants to... Yeah. yeah. The last question from Margaret. Because Sorry, I'd question. just like to mm. <coughs> tell a slightly different story about the ACTT because I'd been in it for um, some years before um, the question of the workshop agreement came up and... Um, Several times, I was already making, um, you know, political films on the side, and um, uh, I sort of sometimes raised very to the unruly things I was doing, and um, I was told every time, "We are not here to stop our members doing what they want to do, we, you know, whether it's art or politics. We're here to protect their interests, and nothing you do, we will not." Um, you know, you can break as many rules as you like, and we won't know. We will only know if um, one of our members working with you complains. Um, so this is, a, a, this is a very different sort of perspective. And, um, um, I, I mean, I find it kind of problematic because I think the sort of backbone of what's happened now with people earning nothing and in the film industry with a lot of people working not just for peanuts but for no wages is because of the and the key thing that was to my mind what was going on in that period was the attempt the kind of one little bit of economic and political democracy we had in the country before satirism were the trade unions and when the workshop agreement came up this was the first time that members had asked the union to have an agreement which didn't recognize grades and which enabled people to pay themselves all the same and have a completely different arrangement. And the union said yes. And the workshop agreement didn't depend on Channel 4. You could, you know, the union accepted it. And if you could force another employer to accept it, you could work anywhere by that agreement. So I think it's very ambivalent. And I have to say that I quite profoundly disagree with your analysis. Sorry. No, that's, that's, that's fair enough. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying as well, really. I think there probably were just, you know, two sides to it in a way. It depended if you were excluded or not, for one thing. And, um, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Penny. I just want to finish up by um, maybe connecting tonight's event to the Keywords exhibition, because... In the show, I don't know if you saw the show, but anyway, the, the premise of the exhibition is, um, is a, collection, uh, a selection of works from Tate's collection inspired by Raymond Williams' book, Keywords. And so there's a sort of element of the show which is about juxtaposing the words and the works. But there's another aspect to the show which was 
our selection was defined by um, the period from 1979, and it focuses mostly on the 1980s. And the work in the show reflects the different kinds of oppositional politics that were active at that time. I mean, some of them, so Northern Ireland politics, AIDS politics, race politics, uh, gay liberation politics. And it was quite interesting. And in a way, when I, when I see the show, I think that it's a kind of collage and maybe a sort of retrospective fantasy to have those things together in the same room. And so it was, it was very interesting to see your film, which actually was a sort of forum in which those different politics actually were actively brought together by, in, in, in one single project. So, I mean, this is really more of a comment than a question. Um, the other thing that I wanted to link it to was a talk that we had uh, by Linda Bellos, where she talked about equality law. And she talked about the law as a, something which was, could be taken up by progressive causes and used effectively, which I think is a bit different from the position that you're taking in your film, which is how the law comes to criminalize political um, revolt. So those are just two ways that it really resonated for me in terms of the whole project. So thank you very much. And Thank you, Kojo and Anjali, for making the selection and hosting it. And mostly thank you to Penny Stemple for coming and showing us her wonderful film, which has been um, overlooked for too long. Thank you. <laughs>